everyone. We're going to be talking about creating backyard bird habitat today. Uh, Lara and I are both natural resources agents. We are not wildlife specialists and we are not um, people who tend to focus on backyards, but this whole series being focused on backyards, we were trying to bring the natural resources and conservation angle to people's backyards. So we'll be approaching backyard bird habitat from the perspective of natural habitat and species and how to attract those species. As Lara said, please feel free to ask your questions in the chat box. I will be ignoring the chat box for the entire presentation, and then Lara will facilitate some questions at the end. So what are you going to learn today? What we're going to talk about are a little bit about how birds choose habitat. We'll then be talking about how you can improve your backyard to potentially attract more birds, or if you get questions from your friends colleagues or clientele if you work in the industry, you'll have some advice that you can give them for the same purpose. So with that, we have our first poll question. Uh, if you've participated in our polls here, you know we like to do these. Um, so this one is a short answer. It's a little different if you've participated in some of our past webinars. So if you could go ahead and please list the four things that when considered together make up habitat. We would love to see your responses. And after we get several, we will broadcast them to you. All right, excellent. We're starting to see some answers coming in. Thank you, everyone. We'll just give about 10 more seconds to see if we can get a few more answers. All right, thank you so much, everyone. You can see now what your um, other participants had guessed for us. So thank you so much, Lara. We're going to go ahead and go to the next slide. So what we were looking for there is food, water, shelter, and space. This is no different than any other wildlife, but you might have interpreted these four things differently based on your past experiences. But what we want to think about when we're talking about backyard birds is consider your own family. Why might you choose to live in a given area? What humans consider habitat and what wildlife consider habitat really are not all that different. We're going to be looking for quality and proximity to schools for our children, employment, which provides money for food and water and housing. We're going to look for affordable and quality housing and general proximity to resources, so shopping, parks, like I said, schools, entertainment of various kinds. And so when we're thinking about our backyard habitats for birds and other wildlife, we want to take into consideration the types of qualities that we like to think about for habitat but then translate it for animals. So food, water, shelter, and space. And it is different for different species. So what you're looking at here is an eight kilometer square. This is the city of Bartow, which is where my office is um, located. My office is right down there. And so in this eight kilometer square, this is how our larger birds might look at habitat. And so this is the estimated habitat view for a hawk. And so as you're looking at this, you can see various areas that might be attractive to them. You've got urban areas, which could have uh, prey items like rodents and other small mammals. You've got a nice forested area over here that could provide shelter and nesting habitat, as well as water and additional prey. You've got nice open fields, some agriculture, um, a variety of mixed urban uses over here. So when you're looking at something from this large scale perspective, it's easy to see how an animal like a hawk would be able to find a suitable habitat, at least in this area of central Florida. The more uniform this, kilometer, this square looks, 
the more difficulty an animal or a bird would have to find good habitat. So lucky for a hawk, they have quite a large range and they would be able to find something in most areas in this part of the state. But when we consider other things like songbirds, we're looking at a much smaller square. So like I said, this is my office right here. Oh, the arrow does not seem to be working anymore. So that large gray area on the right hand side of the smaller picture, that is my office. And across the street, we've got some mixed low density office space next to a small neighborhood. And so there, the wren, which is what this is for, can only really look at a square mile or a square kilometer, sorry. And so in this space, you can still see a variety of habitat that this little bird would be interested in. We've got a variety in vegetative structure. We have trees. We have open area for foraging. It's not so dense that there's no green space, but there are other areas where they might be able to find food. And so it's important to keep in mind what Critter, what critters and what birds you're trying to attract to your backyard and how they perceive the world. So if this small neighborhood right here was interested in attracting more songbirds, they might want to get with their neighbors and see what's missing in their habitat. So they might look for small um, grassy patches that are taller than turf grass. They might want to look for adding a water feature if there's not one already present. And getting with their neighbors helps really give a more wholesome large-scale habitat. So it's important to think beyond your yard in that regard. If you involve your neighbors, including distant neighbors, they don't have to be next-door neighbors, if you increase the areas of um, small wild areas, and they don't have to be truly wild, they can be manicured and be backyard habitat, um, but varying the different habitat types in your community both next door neighbors and further apart, will give you higher quality habitat. Animals, like people, like variety. And so they can vary what they are looking for day to day, season to season, and year to year to suit their needs. And the more that you can provide for that, the better your area will look. Don't forget to involve city staff. If you have parks nearby, perhaps they'll let you put in a pollinator garden if you and a few neighbors agree to maintain it and not incur additional cost to the city. Or they might be interested in having um, community volunteers and then you can use city resources. You really, it can't hurt to ask. So if you've got small pocket parks in your urban area, this is a great way to improve habitat in an urban setting. What you're looking at here are two overhead shots of some neighborhoods in Winter Haven, Florida, which is where I live. So what, in the chat box, go ahead and let me know which one you think would be more attractive to birds, the one on the left or the one on the right. Okay, pretty much everyone is saying left. I would tend to agree, but I am not a bird, so I won't say for sure. But what is it about the picture on the left that makes you think that there would be more interest in birds? And there are a couple people who said the one on the right. So if you would um, say why you might think it would be the right, I'd love to see what your thoughts are there. All right, so we're seeing that there's more green space on the left. There's a variety of habitat, shelter, trees. Um, the one on the right has more grassy areas. So this one on the right could simply be improved by adding some shrubby areas. Um, even if they were on the borders of the different houses, it wouldn't have to take a lot of energy to put in just a little bit more habitat. So as it stands right now, the one on the left is more likely to be better habitat for some species, and the one on the right, if they're in a ridge ecosystem, they might have some species that really like that open air. So the key question to ask in a situation like this is what species are you trying to attract? Every species has a preferred habitat, and you want to consider that species when you're looking at habitat requirements. So we're going to move on to gardening for birds. And so we are now moving into your backyard or your potential friends, family, clients, or colleagues' backyards and what you could do to improve what you've already got. So we've got another question. 
and this one relates to standing dead trees in your yard, also called snags. True or false, leaving standing dead trees provides no benefit to wildlife. All right, that's pretty much everyone. Thank you so much, Lara, if you could broadcast those results real quick. So most of you chose false, which is the correct answer. Dead trees in your yard provide a lot of habitat for birds of different shapes and sizes. And so one of the things that we like to talk about is shelter. And again, thinking about the specific habitat for the specific species you're trying to attract. So with each shelter, if you're talking about songbirds, for instance, you might be interested in creating multiple islands of, ve of vegetation in your yard that provide lots of little areas of shelter for them to hide in and call from, and then they can go out into the grassy parts of your yard to um, forage and find other insects. Maybe there are some um, weedy species in your yard that provide a seed that they like to eat. So having those islands of a vegetation are a great way to provide that patchy, varied habitat that they look for. In those islands or on the edges of your yard, if that's where you prefer to have your habitat, you're going to want to incorporate a mixture of vegetation structure and texture. So what I mean by that is a tree is tall, grass is short, we have tall grasses that are three feet tall or larger, and those provide different structure and texture. So texturally, grass has more cover, um, less sturdy branches, but for some species they prefer to hide under the grassy areas, or conversely their prey likes to hide in those areas. For structure, what we're really talking about for birds is vertical structure. So having a grassy area, a shrubby area, taller trees, mid-story trees, Having a mixture of that in your immediate area looks really attractive to a variety of birds that you might be attracting to your backyard. And like I mentioned before, you might want to consider leaving large woody debris or snags. This could be a shrub that died in your yard. If you don't want it wherever it died, you can pull it up and place it in the corner of your yard. That will provide a lot of habitat for both small prey items and for the small decomposing insects that woodpeckers and other birds like to eat. And so, not saying your whole yard needs to be full of dead things, but if you have an area where you don't mind leaving a old brush pile, then you can provide a lot of habitat for things like fireflies, small spiders, and things that birds really like to eat. You also want to think about forage. So if you're into gardening in such a way that you would like to add plants to your yard, we can recommend planting various types of native vegetation. There's a caveat, though. If you're planting native vegetation for birds, you need to be OK with the idea that they might eat it, or that it might not look pretty all the time if the birds you're attracting like caterpillars, and those caterpillars are on your native vegetation. So if you plant a variety of, of vegetation, that fruits and flowers throughout the year. So beautyberry is beginning to fruit right now. It flowered a few months ago, and I'll have brilliant purple berries um, starting very shortly in most parts of the state. You might be OK with that at first being all beautiful and purple, but birds love beautyberry. It's a great treat for them. And so just be OK with the idea that it might not look beautiful in a month or so when the birds have eaten some of the berries off of the plant. Just know that. You put it there so that you could help local wildlife, and they are loving you for it. Again, consider designs which increase that edge habitat. So that would be the island effect in your yard. And those different edges provide really critical habitat for small birds especially. It's an area where they can go into the shrubby bits, and they can hide from the larger birds that might be predators, or from cats, or other small mammal predators. And then they can go out and forage as they like. And again, consider leaving snags and woody debris if it's OK and if it is safe. We don't want you leaving large, uh, tippy snags right next to your house or a playground. Please use common sense. But if it's appropriate for the location, snags can provide a lot of habitat for birds that people really like to look at, like owls and woodpeckers.
So some recommended species, if you're in the Central Florida or Florida area, I know we have some people who like to watch our webinars from out of state, but these are specific to the Southeast, specifically Florida. Different uh, varieties of holly trees and shrubs. So one would be Ilex vomitoria. That's also um, a small shrub holly. We've got um, Dahoon holly. That's a really popular one with the birds in this area. There are many, many varieties of holly. Just you can call your local extension office and get recommendations on a fruiting holly tree or a shrub for your yard. American Beautyberry, I already mentioned. I don't have a great picture of it, but I do recommend you look it up. It is a beautiful plant with bright purple berries. Can get quite large, can get up to eight feet in full sun without pruning. So be careful where you put these plants. We want them to be low maintenance. Um, some others that you might be interested if you're looking for a tree or a large shrub would be mulberry species or Chickasaw plum or Flatwoods plum. We have a couple different plum species for this area. They produce small plums that you can eat, but most people don't because they're small and sour. The birds love them, though. Same thing with southern magnolia. If you're looking for a large shade tree that also provides forage, um, magnolia is popular. If you live in an area where you're trying to attract uh, turkey or other game species, you might look at putting some oaks in. If you live on the water and you're trying to attract birds, lily pads and pickerel weed are great species to add to your waterfront because they provide both forage and shelter for those species. So we're going to move on to artificial habitat, but if you have more questions about gardening for birds, if you look down in the web link box, you'll see we have a native plants document. It's for the panhandle, but a lot of it is applicable to most of the southeast and for most of Florida. We also have a specific res um, resource for hummingbirds and a document on why we shouldn't feed water birds. So those are all great um, documents for you there. And we're going to move on to habitat. So when I say habitat, artificial habitat, what I'm talking about are nest boxes, bird baths, and bird feeders. So just like when you're planting additional vegetation in your yard or you're looking at habitat requirements, you want to do so deliberately. Be strategic about it. Are you trying to attract a wood duck to your waterfront because you think they're pretty and you would like to look at them? This is what a wood duck house looks like. It's a tall, skinny box that has a, um, a relatively large hole for a birdhouse, and you're going to want predator protection on the bottom of it. You can't see it, but Will is standing in a wetland right there, so you're going to want to take that into consideration. Is the habitat in your yard appropriate for the bird you want to have in a nest box? So you're going to want to know what style and size is appropriate for the bird you want to attract, and you want to practice overall habitat improvement. So the things that I've already discussed about forage and shelter, those are also still important. You want to make your yard attractive so they know to look for a nesting area in your yard, and then they can choose a birdhouse. So in the resource box, the top one that I have there is called Helping Cavity Nesters in Florida. You will find specific styles and sizes appropriate for the birds you want to attract. And I know I kind of just gave the answer away, but we have another poll question. So which type of bird is most likely to use your nest box or birdhouse, which is the same thing? All right, and if you could broadcast those, Lara. Thank you so much. So most people chose primary cavity nesters. This one was not meant to be a trick question, but the answer is actually secondary cavity nesters. And I'm going to go into why that may be right now. So cavity nester birds are birds that look for small holes or in some cases large holes. Turkey vultures are our largest cavity nester. Um, but primary cavity nesters excavate their own holes. So these would be your woodpecker species, primarily speaking. And so the reason that they don't 
look for birdhouses is because they look for those dead trees or those trees with decay where they can make their perfect little nest box in themselves. They have the means and the desire to spend the time making their own little home there. Um, some other cavity nesters are your secondary cavity nesters. And these are the ones that are more likely to use a nest box or birdhouse. And the reason for that is they look for holes that other primary cavity nesters have abandoned or have left for the season. And so these species would be the ones that are looking for holes that already exist. And that's why they're going to be um, looking for those birdhouses. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry about that. So one species that people really like in this area of the state is the eastern screech owl. You can see he's a cute little guy about um, oh, six, six inches tall, maybe eight. Um, and the boxes that they use are quite large with a oval hole in them. And if you're looking at that cavity nester document later on, the pages four through six have dimensions for building any of these boxes that you're interested in having. We do recommend that you use untreated wood that is approximately one inch in thickness for the, um, for the birdhouses that you are making. And another popular one in agricultural areas is the barn owl. So you can see the barn owl box looks very different from most birdhouses, but this structure is what suits them best, and these will be on a large pole out in the middle of agricultural areas, and they help control the rodent population that might um, be an issue in some of those areas. So some of your secondary cavity nesters that you might see in your yard would be bluebirds, chickadees, screech owls, ducks, etc. If you live in an area with water and you've seen those round houses on the water with a pointed lid on them, those are wood duck boxes and they're meant to simulate an old tree that has a cavity in it on the water or in a swampy area and that point on top is to help with predator protection, is to prevent um, predator birds from perching on top. So what makes an attractive nest box? These are all things that you want to consider. Just like people, they have very specific real estate requirements. So <laughs> overall size of the box, the size of the hole, um, they want the hole, the entrance, to be just large enough for them to get through and not some of their larger predators. This is one of the biggest issues with store-bought nest boxes and birdhouses is that the sizing is all wrong and the hole is large enough for other critters to use. In Florida, if the hole is the wrong size, you might get squirrels or flying squirrels living in there and they will um, take that box over so that birds can no longer use it. Um, you're also going to want to make sure it doesn't say this on here, but it has to have good drainage and the overall style and perch style is important. So for a lot of these cavity nesters, they don't need perches because they are used to clinging to the outside of a tree. So if you put a perch, you might actually be attracting other predator species or nest inhabitants to come in and take over the box. Proximity and density of adjacent vegetation, again, you're going to want to have good habitat to attract a bird, but what we're talking about here is actually predator protection. So by limiting the amount of uh, vegetation surrounding a box specifically meant to attract a nesting mother. You want to limit that vegetation so there's less chance of predators hiding in it. On that picture on the left, you can see that little upside down cone on the pole. That is to prevent things like snakes from coming up the pole and into the box. You can do the same thing on trees if necessary. So we have another poll question. And this is for what we're about to talk about. So how frequently must a bird bath be washed? I know some of you might be thinking, well, I thought the answer was never, but that is not a choice. So <laughs> just give me your best guess here. All right, and that's a pretty good response right Lara. Thank you. All right, so most people chose every three to four days. The answer that is closest to the truth is every other week. So current literature recommends that um, 
that we wash our bird baths every 10 days or so. So in an area that doesn't have other water, a bird bath can provide that water that most birds are really interested in having in their habitat. So what you're going to look for in a bird bath is you want a shallow bowl or um, platter style. You're going to want gently sloping sides so that the birds don't fall in the water and a slightly rough texture so that their little feet can grab onto it. Now, Gently sloping sides and slightly rough in texture and shallow water are all breeding grounds for bacteria, algae, and other contamination. And we're attracting a lot of birds to a very small area of water. And that's why we need to wash the bird houses or the bird baths out. The reason for that is when you attract all these species to a very small area, you you create a habitat that is perfect for spreading disease and bacteria to the birds. So you want to make sure that you clean out your bird bath at least every other week, um, with the current recommendation being 10 days or so, with a very mild bleach solution. And you can find more information on that in the document below um, listed as attracting backyard birds, bird feeder selection, and also tips for success, the 10 tips for success. So you can put it on the ground, as you see in this picture, or on a pedestal. It will attract different birds in each way, but you want to refill it, let it dry out every now and then. Make sure you're scrubbing it with a mild bleach solution every other week or so. And in the current climate with mosquito issues and the Zika virus, you must clean it out at least every two weeks. We do recommend more frequently than that to reduce the likelihood of having mosquitoes breeding in that bird bath. So when we're talking about bird feeders, there is an ongoing controversy over whether or not we should be recommending people to have bird feeders. But the primary benefit of a bird feeder, from my perspective, is that you're attracting birds to an area where they can be more easily observed. So rather than having them on the far side of your yard where that beautiful native vegetation you put in is, you can put a little bit of bird feeder um, nearer to a window and it'll bring them to an area that lets you appreciate them and their beauty a little bit more. And so anything that can help people appreciate our nat native wildlife is something I'm supportive of. But just like the birding, birds have preferences and we want to do it strategically. And I just gave away the answer to the last poll question, but we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so when we're doing this, just like with vegetation and housing, please be very discriminant in how you apply bird feeding in your yard. We do not want to attract pest critters, and we do not want to attack potentially aggressive critters either. So feeding birds and well, feeding wildlife in general is not allowed in the state of Florida. It is generally understood that there is an exemption for a bird feeder as long as it's not attracting nuisance wildlife like coyotes and bears. So if you get to the point where your bird feeder is attracting those critters, you need to reconsider it, get in contact with Florida Fish and Wildlife, and they have predator and wildlife resistant bird feeder recommendations that you can use. I will add that link at the end and email it out to you. But in an area where you're just interested in feeding a few birds, it can be done if you're specific and deliberate with it. So Lara, if we could get our last poll question. Sorry, guys, I forgot about that one. How far away from vegetation should a bird feeder be placed in your yard? All right, that's pretty good. So pretty even split here. The, cre the correct answer is dun, 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 10 to 15 feet away from vegetation. And so this is specifically for predators. It's not to say that you are definitely going to have predators, but it means that a bird is less likely to use your feeder if it thinks a predator could get to it. And so 10 to 15 feet is the recommended distance from vegetation. If you're going to put your bird feeder near a window, we recommend you put it within four feet of that window. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And the reason for that is we do not want the birds, if they get spooked, to fly into the glass and harm themselves. So we've actually found the closer to the window, the better, because there's less chance of them building up velocity before they hit that window. 
So birds have preferences. You're going to attract the smaller birds with the tube feeders, like the one pictured here. And the reason for that is it takes a small bird to get in that little tube feeder hole. And you can also put smaller seed in there. Hopper feeders are your traditional ones that are shaped like a small house and have a flat area for seed. And then you can also use fruit holders and suet holders. Now each um, type of feeder does attract some different types of birds. So for instance, the platform or hopper feeders are um, some that will attract doves, blackbirds, sparrows, things like that. Um, you can also get blue jays and cardinals at those. Suet feeders, which you can purchase at the store or go online and learn from a DIY how to make that, those will attract things like uh, woodpeckers, wrens, cardinals, titmice in the winter, things like that. The tube feeders, the small birds, um, you can attract things like goldfinches and chickadees, um, wrens, warblers, things like that. So that's what you want to keep in mind with that. I did not go into a lot of detail with the bird feeders because we have such a fantastic resource for you in that web link. It's that second one you see, bird feeder selection. It goes through each different type of feeder and it even recommends different um, types of food. My take home here is do not buy the combination mixes that say songbird food. We want to be more specific than that. So different types of food are good for different seeds, I mean different birds. So look for the more expensive feed is generally speaking better because it's higher quality and it's an individual type of food. So it might be black oil, black oil sunflower, could be safflower seeds, could be thistle seeds. Be very specific in the foods that you use and you have less chance of attracting those nuisance species. So in summary, Native birds are adapted to our native plants. They need this for their overall habitat needs like food and shelter and nesting habitat. If you're able to improve your yard, that's awesome. If you're able to work with your neighbors and improve your overall community's habitat, that's even better. If you're going to use a feeder, because I understand people like to see birds close to their homes, just be strategic with it. Please do not buy the generic seed feeds. Uh, be very strategic in what you choose. Use that link down in the bottom left hand corner to pick the right feed for the um, species you're attracting. And feeders and bird baths must be cleaned frequently to help reduce diseases in our backyard birds. How sad would it be if we attracted them all and then they got sick? So please be careful when you're using bird feeders and bird baths. And from our perspective with natural resources, we like to focus on overall habitat improvement. So with that, I will take any questions that Lara might have for me. Okay, thank you, Shannon. So we did not have any questions that you did not already address that were asked. So if anyone has questions for Shannon specific to this webinar, um, you can type them in the chat box now and we will answer them. Um, if not, since I don't see anyone typing. I'll just go ahead and at least advance to the next slide. Um, if you don't have any questions, uh, we would very much appreciate you taking some time to complete our short evaluation by clicking on the link on your screen. Um, and again, this was the last webinar for the 2016 series. So if you want to view the recordings of our previous webinars, that link is also provided there on your screen. Okay, I don't know if Shannon, I, I'll read the question that just came in um, from Bill. Would owls eat any feeder type of food? That's a great question, Bill. I would say no, not likely. Um, with wildlife, I do want to say anything is possible. If they were to go for anything, it would probably probably need to be the foods that are, are made from other small critters like the mealworms or something like that on a platform feeder. Um, but generally speaking, no, owls are hunters. They prefer and really like to go after moving prey. They're quite skilled at it. So if you have a desire to increase the owl population in your area, unfortunately the best way to do that would be to increase their prey item um, 
populations in your area, which tend to be mice and other rodents, which most people don't like to attract to their yard. But if that is something you're interested in, or if you're in an area where you already have those critters and are not seeing any owls, you might want to consider adding an owl box or a large dominant tree that could give them a perching space, um, or a brush pile in the corner to provide habitat that's easy for them to see. That would be a way that you could attract owls. Yeah, if they were to go for a feeder source, it would probably be the dried insects, but I would not expect it. Other birds would love them, though. You're very welcome. Anyone okay. else have questions? Yes, if anyone else has questions, please type it in the chat box. We still have um, some time, and Shannon will answer them. Those resources in the bottom left-hand corner, specifically the bird feeder selection in the Bird um, Helping Cavity Nesters of Florida publication, have really great recommendations for individual species if you're interested. For instance, on page 7 of the bird feeder selection, there's actually a chart that recommends a feeder style for each different bird, and then you can look at the actual feed source, like seed type, in the text. But for instance, if you were interested in um, in getting some warblers to your yard, they recommend using a suet feeder. So just really great resources all around, highly recommend them. And there is even one in there if you live in a community with an artificial lake or a large stormwater pond and you want to create a nesting island for wading birds, there is a highly te technical document down there that you can use for that as well. But it does require a lot of time and energy. OK, I see one person typing, so we'll see what they have to say. And otherwise, we will wrap it up. OK, let's see. Ooh, what type of suit question. holds up in warm weather? <laughs> Mm -hmm. There's not a great answer for that. Um, in Florida, I wouldn't recommend using a suet feeder any time other than the cold months and keeping it in the shade as well. So you can find some suet holders that are more cage-like rather than the spike type. Um, those are more likely to stay together, but it, it does melt in direct sunlight and in warm weather. Lara, do you have any other suggestions there? I don't know. It's, I'm not as familiar with that particular type of feeder, but I think think you answered it pretty well. Mm -hmm. The homemade ones, in my experience, melt easier than the store-bought ones. I'm not sure if they're using some type of preservative in the store-bought suet that allows it to stay together better or not, but that's something that you could experiment with um, altering the different ingredient levels at the home uh, suet type, so that might be something to experiment with. Yeah, and there are some recommendations in that document um, about how to kind of make your own if you're interested in that. But they do recommend uh, the cooler months of the year. So it's melty. Okay, I see. We've got one more minute till one o'clock, so we'll see. Oh, I thought somebody was typing. Well, we will. Uh, go ahead and wrap up then. If you guys have any other questions, uh, you can feel free to reach out to Shannon and I um, or me via email. And um, like I said, we will be sending uh, an email with the link to the recording of this webinar uh, shortly, hopefully by the end of the day today or by the end of the week at the latest. So thank you all for tuning in, and we will keep you posted with any future webinars we might have in store for you.